Thou hast delivered us, O Lord, from them that afflict us, and hast put them to shame that hate us. Those are words taken from uh, today's gradual for the Holy Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I would like to begin this sermon by introducing two individuals from the Old Testament in the Holy Bible. These two men were political leaders more than two millennia ago. The first is known as Cyrus the Great. And Cyrus the Great was the king of Persia. And he led that empire during the Jewish exile in captivity in Babylon. And the Holy Bible is clear that Cyrus, who was not part of God's people, he was a pagan, received a divine inspiration to issue an official decree that would have the temple in Jerusalem rebuilt and that the Jews would go back to the Holy Land for the purpose of rebuilding God's house. And moreover, Cyrus the Great showed his interest in the project by sending back with the Jews the sacred vessels which had been stolen from the first temple, as well as a considerable sum of money with which to buy and build materials and the temple itself. In fact, Josephus, the famous Jewish historian of old reports that Cyrus decreed the following, namely that, quote, the priests shall offer these sacrifices according to the law of Moses in Jerusalem. And when they offer them, they shall pray to God for the preservation of the king and of his family, that the kingdom of Persia may continue, unquote. See, Cyrus the Great, though a pagan, He knew the power of the God of the Jews. Cyrus was a practical leader. He understood the importance of religion and religious liberty for the Jewish people so that they could practice the true faith at that time and they would offer blood sacrifices to appease the just wrath of God. Cyrus was praised, therefore, by God's people in the Old Testament to the point that the prophet Isaiah calls him the anointed of the Lord, a Messiah-like character that would prefigure Christ himself. Now, Cyrus the Great was not a man of perfect virtue. He had multiple wives, concubines, and he lived in tremendous luxury. He conquered many nations and built a great empire. Yet the good Lord used this very flawed man to accomplish a divine plan for his holy people. Now, the second individual, from the Holy Bible that I want to mention today, is a man named Antiochus, King Antiochus. Antiochus was a sinister schemer, a deceitful man, and quite crafty in the way that he attempted to overthrow the worship of the true God. Antiochus was an ideologue with a fixed revolutionary agenda to change radically the people that he ruled over. Antiochus hated religious liberty for the Jews. He wanted them to abandon their religion and to change their very culture. King Antiochus was a brutal tyrant who demanded conformity to his twisted vision. Antiochus is written of especially in the books of the Maccabees. In fact, church fathers tell us that Antiochus was and is considered a prefigurement of the Antichrist himself. Various Antichrist figures, be it Antiochus, Muhammad, Luther, Hitler, or Stalin, desire to create a counterfeit kingdom of God, where instead of Christ being at the center, it is these men who style themselves as gods who were at the center. Antiochus initially spread his new cultural outlook using infiltration practices. Unfaithful and apostate Jews wormed their way into various institutions. Through these infidels, Antiochus introduced a new religion that especially targeted the young. Instead of going to the temple to worship the true God, for example, the young Jewish men would head to the gym and they would parade around like pagans with nothing on. These Jewish men then covered up their circumcision marks, forgetting that they were sons of Abraham. 
And yes, it would get worse. Antiochus would also send out agents to enforce his new agenda, demanding that incense be offered to pagan gods instead of the true God of the Jews. And those who resisted such change were brutally tortured and killed. Those mothers who had their boys circumcised would be killed along with their infants. And those who would not eat pork, uh, food forbidden to the Jews, would have it forcibly shoved down their throats before being, being put to the sword. The sacred scriptures of the Jews were banned. The Sabbath was eliminated. Ancient Hebrew was replaced by a new language. And the only religion that was acceptable was a paganized version of the Jewish religion. He even erected a statue of Zeus in the temple in Jerusalem. And as many of you might know, the family of the Maccabees rose up and resisted this demonic revolution. After much suffering, God's people saw relief when Antiochus was visited by a mysterious and deadly disease. Now, why do I go through this, these two men? Although most analogies limp, I would like to compare these two ancient leaders with the two candidates who are now running for president. Although one may not be an anointed one, and the other may not be an actual prefigurement of the Antichrist, I would say that there are some interesting connections which might suggest that one candidate is sort of Cyrus-like, while the other leans in the direction of an Antiochus-like ruler. The former seems to be a practical man without any deep ideological convictions, but rather a populist who has responded to the voices of a large constituency. He would be open, most likely, to dialogue and deal-making. The latter candidate, however, is a pure, unadulterated ideologue, a true revolutionary whose formative years were spent at the feet of some of the most infamous radicals in our nation's history. Nothing traditional is safe with her in power. As far as I know, the Cyrus-like candidate is the only one to offer publicly a list of Supreme Court justices that he will choose from. All of the names on the list are supported by all pro-life groups, and by those who advocate a judicial branch that interprets the law as opposed to legislating from the bench. This same candidate also has promised to ensure protections for religious free speech and against the government punishing its own citizens for acting out of religious beliefs. When he chose a running mate, the candidate in question selected one of the most pro-life, pro-marriage, and pro-religious freedom politicians in the entire country. And interestingly enough, this Cyrus-like candidate has promised to liberate religious institutions from grossly unfair and unconstitutional limitations that were placed upon them by the government when Lyndon Baines Johnson was a senator. In other words, he has made a promise that he will end that decades-old ban on tax-exempt groups, which includes Catholic Church, getting involved with politics. While many radical legislatures and judges would like to fine, jail, or further punish Christians for their stand against supporting the culture of death and the sodomitical agenda, this candidate has stated the following, quote, I will be working on freeing up your religion freeing up your thoughts. You talk about religious liberty and religious freedom, you don't have any religious freedom if you think about it, unquote. The same candidate then added, in a very Cyrus-like way, quote, I think maybe that will be my greatest contribution to Christianity, is to allow you, when you talk religion, to go and speak openly, unquote. Now, I could go into further positions of this candidate, including his nationalist platform that puts America first, or protecting our borders or our manufacturing sector or our interests in regards to foreign affairs. But I will simply add that this modern-day Cyrus has 
all the right enemies. As a past president of the United States once stated, quote, I ask you to judge me by the enemies I have made, unquote. Despite all the obvious flaws of the candidate in question, despite his untoward behaviors of the past, and yes, the present, he has all the right enemies. The liberal media despises him. The professional political elite class hates him. The plutocrats on Wall Street and big finance fear him. Hollywood disdains him. Globalists and New World Order elites with their multicultural agendas, borderless worldview, and forced compliance that would put down any Maccabean revolt, those people can't stand him. In short, everyone that hates him also happens to hate Christ and hates the Catholic Church. Now, we now come to the candidate that reminds me of a would-be Antiochus. She is part of that elite class which has been winning the culture wars for the past, well, 50 years. This candidate may tolerate the non-compliant for now. She may tolerate us for a little bit, but how long will this toleration last? She and her ilk consider traditional leaning persons to be a basket of deplorables, irredeemable, clinging to their guns and religion. It is inevitable that her temporary policy of toleration towards traditional leaning people will become one of act of persecution. It's already happened. Radical ideologues with a secularist agenda will demand incense be offered. You either comply or there will be compulsion. It's your choice. You will accept further the HHS mandate. You will accept the sodomitical agenda. You must accept the culture of death. You must bow before the golden calf of a new world order religion. This Antiochus-like candidate is a radical pro-abortionist ideologue, completely committed to maintaining and spreading the culture of death. In a recent speech, she stated that far too many women struggle to obtain abortion today. She then added, quote, all the laws we pass don't count for much if they're not enforced. Rights have to exist in practice, not just on paper. Laws have to be backed up with resources and political willpower, unquote. And then she added this chilling statement to any modern-day Maccabee that would hold to the belief of all their ancestors. She threatens them, saying, quote, and deep-seated cultural codes, religious beliefs, and structural biases have to be changed you will have to change your beliefs. And with the voice of a grating schoolmarm, rigid and robotic in her ways, she proclaimed the following. The unborn person doesn't have any constitutional rights. The only people that I would ever appoint to the Supreme Court are people who believe that Roe v. Wade, the abortion decision, is settled law, unquote as Antiochus fomented revolution within Jewish culture by introducing pagan customs and norms, so this modern-day Antiochus plans to infiltrate further the Catholic Church. This is not an exaggeration. It is not an overstatement. If Stalin infiltrated the Russian Orthodox Assembly in Soviet Russia with many KGB agents and fellow travelers sympathetic to the cause, then one cannot dismiss such a conspiracy to infiltrate and destroy the church. Email exchanges, which we have come to see, between various operatives working for her campaign bear this out. This woman, as Secretary of State, was a main figure in bringing about the so-called Arab Spring, bringing revolution, instability, and bloody conflict in North Africa and the Middle East, all in an effort to force compliance, to make these Arab nations embrace liberal, godless, Western democratic values. But if there would be an Arab spring overseas, then why not have a quote-unquote Catholic spring over here? One of her main advisors writes, quote, there needs to be a Catholic spring 
in which Catholics themselves demand the end of the Middle Age dictatorship, unquote. In response to this cry for revolution, another advisor of hers agreed that this was the moment for revolution in the church and that there could be, quote, a beginning of a little democracy and respect for gender equality in the Catholic Church all in the service of getting or forcing getting U.S. bishops to drop their opposition to the contraception mandate in Obamacare, unquote. The email exchange then broached the idea of infiltrating the church with little spring movements that will bring about change. One journalist commented on the email exchanges of the campaign in the following way, quote, they reveal the depths of the hostility of Hillary Clinton and her campaign toward Catholics and the open anti-Catholic bigotry of her senior advisors who attacked the deeply held beliefs and theology of Catholics, unquote. Finally, if this modern-day Antiochus wins, she will likely name three to four Supreme Court justices. These new justices will be ideologues, cementing the revolution against Christ the King even further. This woman who tells us that it takes a village to raise a child will work towards opposing homeschooling, for she believes it is the government's right to educate children, not the parents. She will restrict religious speech and persecute Christians who refuse to support her radical social agenda. Bakers, photographers, pizza restaurant owners will continue to be facing the wrath of the state because they're not adapting to Sodom and Gomorrah. The choice is between Cyrus and Antiochus, in a way. Pope Pius XII once stated, Consequently, there is a heavy responsibility on everyone, man or woman, who has a right to vote, especially, listen here, especially when the interests of religion are at stake. Abstention in this case is in itself it should be thoroughly understood, a grave and fatal sin of omission, unquote. Choose wisely, for our future in some way depends on what happens on November 8th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.